and I'm blessed to see other missionaries here from Kenya. In fact, I was just telling them I'll be in Kenya next month myself, not far from where they're at. Closer than here, anyways. <laughs> A lot closer. Well, it's good to be back. Um, we've, we're doing a lot of things. You know, I've been a missionary for over 35 years now. Been in the ministry over 40 years. And we started out full-time in the ministry in southern Missouri. And that was back in the 70s, you know. But I got a little presentation I want to show you. Not about our whole ministry, don't worry. I'm not one that gives a lot of slides and pictures and sad stories. You know, because I find that when you do that, people give because they feel sa sorry for you. But, but they don't have a heart for you. So, you know, we don't do all that stuff. But this is just a, I think it's three minutes and 20-some seconds long, little presentation of just what we've done this year. Most of our ministry is all around the world. We've done over 40 countries, 50 countries of the world. But we do a lot in Myanmar, and it's in the news a lot. And so most of this is about Myanmar. So if you want to run that, please. That's just this year's work. Uh, my son went with me. My son's a youth pastor in Arizona. He went with me this year. He actually wrote that song for our ministry. And so he's a worship leader, a youth pastor, associate pastor, 
and he went with me, and I'll minister there. I like to have him travel with me all the time, but we don't have the funds to do that. So, but we just appreciate your prayers. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that. Let's pray. I know we've been praying stuff, but let's pray and prepare to receive the word of God. Father, we come to you this morning, and as we receive the word of God, Lord, we thank you that your word is always anointed, it's powerful, it's quick. And Father, we thank you that it won't return to you void, but you'll accomplish what you sent it to do. Now, Father, anoint our ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us. Anoint me, Father, to speak those things that you want me to share. And we're careful to give you all the praise and the glory this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. How many ever remember the (laughs) A-team? We're dating you. Well, what was the one thing that uh, Mr. T used to always say? Fool. Don't, well, the title of my message today is Don't Be a Fool. Now, I had a little video clip on that, but my son had put it and put some music in there, and I had a pastor say, I won't play that in my church. The music is ungodly. And I thought, it was just background music. I never gave it a thought, you know, because I didn't know what the music was. I just, you know. But anyways, the title of my message is Don't Be a Fool. I'm going to give you three points here this morning. One is don't be a fool. Number two, don't play the fool. And number three is don't die the fool. Now, the first one is easy. You'll be all all able to say amen on it. Okay, so the the first one is easy. The other ones, hopefully, they're easy, but it should help you. In Psalm 14, verse 1, and I love this pulpit, you know. If I could st- stick it in my truck and get away with it, I would do it, but God wouldn't let me. <laughs> I'd love to take that to every church I went to, you know, and just, i come with my own pulpit. <laughs> uh, someone would backslide. Psalms 14, 1. David writes and says, A fool has said in his heart, There is no God. You know, th- And the day we're living in, there are people today that want to take away our right to worship God. They want to take away, you can't say Christmas. I got a sign on my driveway, you know. This is an unpolitically uncorrect zone you're entering. You know, we say, amen. You know, we say, pledge of allegiance. We say, thank God. And this offends you, go away. You know, leave. You know, you won't offend me by leaving. You know, but... They want to do it. They say, you know, you can't have Christian holidays. Well, you know what? The atheist has a holiday every year. Called April Fool's Day. (laughs) Isn't that right? Because the Bible says a fool says there's no God, and we have an April Fool's Day just for them. (laughs) Amen. So next time you talk to one, you're going to have it. Say, well, you got one. But you know... A fool says there's no God. You know, the Bible tells us in Romans 1 that even creation tells us that there is a God. Now, you may, you know, I have people all the time, and please, you know, I'm not trying to promote this. I I probably shouldn't say it. My wife would be pointing her finger at me, shaking her finger at me right now. But, you know, people ask me in England, because we lived in England for 20-some years, and they ask us all the time about our gun culture in America, you know. And I said, well, you have to understand something here. When you take God out of the schools, take God out of our society, we're not allowed to have the Ten Commandments in there. We allow abortion to run rampant, even late-term abortions. We're not talking about just, you know, strange cases. We're talking about, you know, late-term abortions and all that. So there's no sanctity of life anymore. That's right. Then you have in there that you're taught in the schools. I was in university, and they were teaching us in university back in the 60s, there is absolutely no truths. So when they gave me a test, this is true, this is a true story, they gave me a true and false quiz, I marked everything false. And the instructor, you know, marked me wrong, you know, and I, and I agreed, I said, hang on a second, you can't mark it wrong, because you taught me that there's no absolute truth, so everything's got to be false. He gave me credit. At least I gave him credit for the fact that he was smart enough that I could argue his um, theories, you know. You understand what I'm saying? So you take all of that out, and there's no sanctity of life. Then we wonder why somebody wants to go and kill a bunch of people. I mean, even if you don't agree with God, you're a fool, and you don't believe there's a God, take that one commandment out of the other ten and keep the other nine. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not, you know, covet your neighbor's wife, you know, all these. What's wrong with those? I got quiet in the church, didn't it? (laughs) 
So that, and, you know, nobody wants to argue with me anymore. They just kind of change the subject and go on. See, a fool says, no, God, you look at nature. Every year, they say, oh, it's getting cold. It's cold too long. The trees are blooming too soon. No, they don't. You know. In fact, Romans 1, if you go back and read it, we don't have time to read it all. Romans 1 tells you that it says, when they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, and therefore their foolish hearts became darkened. You ever wondered how society got where it's at today? People quit praising God. David says in Psalms 103, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget, forget not all of his benefits, who forgiveth all of your iniquity, who healeth all of your diseases. You know, when you're praising God, you, say, you can't forget get his goodness. When you quit praising God, you start looking at your surroundings and say, Oh, woe is me. You know, I live where the Marines live at right now. I got, you know, the world's largest U.S. Air Force Marine base in my neighborhood. And, uh, and I thank God for them all. But, you know, if I get around them too much, I get depressed. They're all talking about how they get making five grand a month in retirement. I'm thinking, I, I'd like to bring five grand in a month. Wouldn't you, brother? <laughs> you know, and I think, I can't look at them. I'll be, I'll be depressed. I'm 67 years old with no retirement. You know? I, and you know what? God says, just praise me. Have I ever let you down? You know, see, if you keep blessing the Lord, forget not, forget not. And if you go on and read the rest of Romans, it's a verse of scripture that many people wanted to cut out of the Bible. Men go after men and women go after women and, you know, they do ungodly things and all that kind of stuff. Why? Because they forgot God. A fool says no God. Well, you can say amen, I'm not a fool. Amen? Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm not a fool. Know how you know that? Because you're in church. People that don't believe in God don't come to church on Sunday. So that's what I said. It's going to be easy to say amen to this one. Even evolution. I'm going to, I got to do this one. You know, evolution. I got thrown out of science class back in the, probably was a 65, because the teacher said, you know, we come from monkeys. And I said, you may have, but I don't. <laughs> I got thrown out of science class, okay? And I wasn't raised with any knowledge of all this stuff. But, you know, evolution is not even a theory. By scientific standards. It's a hypothesis. It's barely that. To be a theory, you have to meet certain criteria for, to go from a hypothesis to a theory. And then you've got to make, meet more criteria for them to go from a theory to truth. It's still back there somewhere in the hypothesis, but they're teaching it as truth. They violate their own rules when it comes to when they want to bring their own doctrine in. Amen? Anyways. It tells me over in Psalms 92, verse 5 and 6. It says, Oh, Lord, how great are your works. But then it goes on and says, But a fool does not understand this. Aren't you glad you're not a fool? Amen. Okay. Number two, don't play the fool. Now we're going to get into a little bit more where it might be a little bit more difficult. Okay? Have you ever played the fool? You know, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, you know, or shame, fool me once, you know, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Something like that. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 26. That's in the Old Testament. 1 Samuel chapter 26. I'm going to take a look at some of the things that, uh, of the life of Saul for a few moments. Verse 20, chapter 26, verse 21. Saul said, I have sinned. And this is when David, you know, could have killed him. And he, and he took his, um, his spear and all and didn't kill him. We refused to touch God's anointed. Remember, Saul was chasing David around the countryside. And Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will harm you no more, because my life is precious in your eyes this day. Indeed, I have played the fool and erred foolishly. You know, Saul said, I played the fool. How did he play the fool? Let's take a look at Saul for a moment, okay? 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2. I'm moving, I know I'm going quickly. If I had a couple hours, I, I could go slow, but I can't. You know, in Africa and in Myanmar, we get to preach for four hours. And then they say, well, you're not done yet, are you? You know. I don't go back to Vietnam anymore because I have to teach for six hours straight, and I'm sorry, at 67, I just can't do it anymore. 
I'm saying, no, that's a young man's game, you know. <laughs> Anyways, but don't worry, we're not going four hours. <laughs> First Samuel chapter 9, verse 2. And God, and God chose Samuel, or Saul rather, and he said, and he had a, ch a choice and handsome son, and his name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. His shoulders were upward, was taller than any of the people. Now, I want you to notice something. Saul in the natural had everything going for him. He was a quarterback, if you would. You know, he was taller than everybody else. You know, my son played on championship football teams in high school. Four years in a row, they won it three years in a row out of the four. He was the kicker. He's got championship rings and stuff. You know, when you're in that kind of position, all the girls in high school want to get to know you. He had no girlfriends in high school. And we asked him, son, I said, my grandson, I said, what's up? Why don't you have a girlfriend? He said, Grandpa, you don't understand. They just want to get you in bed. <laughs> he was wiser than most. Young women today are aggressive. Thank you for that amen. <laughs> you know, Saul had everything going for him. You know, he was like the quarterback, taller than ever. They said he was more handsome than anybody. He was the ladies' man. Ladies can say amen, you know. You know what I'm talking about. You saw that one, you go, ooh. He had everything in the natural going for him, okay? Yet he still plays fool. You know, I won't name any names, but there was some quarterback from some Texas A&M University who played the fool. You know who I'm talking about? You know, he was Mr. Co he was Mr. Football. He had everything going for him. Where is he today? Hmm. Going on. Better not, I'm meddling now. Don't worry, because, you know, I, I won't go there. You can meddle here. I can meddle there? See, NFL is banned from my house. Thank you. And Nike's going that way, too, by the way. Somebody go, hey, you got to take a stand for something. And if you're taking for a stand for something that's false, then you're in error. Take a stand for truth. And then sacrifice as our military personnel have done, and our mil missionaries have done. Anyways, I, I'm going to meddling again. First Samuel chapter 10. He's, we found out he's handsome, more handsome than any man, but taller than the rest. I mean, he, he, was the foot, he was the basketball player. Verse 1 says, Then Samuel took a flask of oil and said to him, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? Not only is he handsome, he's anointed. How's that, man? I mean, this, his, his life is good, isn't it? Hello? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. His life is good. He's handsome, he's tall, and he's anointed. He's got everything going for him. And then if we go on down, if we back up to chapter um, 9 again, verse 21, when they were try, um, looking for him, he, says, he said, Saul answered and said, I'm a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family, the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin. Why do you speak like this to me? He, had, he was a humble man. He wasn't looking for any fame and glory. He was, a, he was very humble. So he's good looking. He's anointed and he's humble. He's got everything going for him. Isn't that right? You, it even gets better. You ready for this? Then we find in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6, then the Spirit of the Lord would come upon him, and you will prophesy. Not, not only is he anointed, but the Spirit of God comes upon him, he moves in the gifts of the Spirit and prophesies. You know, there's people that are anointed, but they don't move in the gifts of the Spirit. Hello? So Saul now, I'm, I'm drawing you a picture. Saul is handsome, good-looking, a ladies' man. He's got an anointing on him. He's humble. And he's, and he's used by God in the gifts of the Spirit. How many believe he's got a good start? And yet Saul says, I played the fool. How did he play the fool? Let's take a look at Saul's life some more. Okay. First off, in 1 Samuel chapter 10, in verse 21, well, we'll start in verse 20. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. And when he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their family, the family of Matri was chosen, and Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. But when they sought him, he could not be found. 
Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, has a man come yet? And the Lord answered, there he is hidden among the equipment. The first problem Saul had, he was running from the call of God. He's anointed. He's got a call of God on his life, but he's hiding from the call of God. Now, men, I'm going to speak to you. I have motorcycles. I love my motorcycles, but you know what? They're only a tool. God can have them all if he wants them. They're only tools. I love my home. I'm going to get to go hunting this week, you know, deer hunting, bow hunting here in Missouri. I love doing that. So, but you know what? They're just tools. How many men, though, are so busy because they've got so much equipment they don't have time for God? I've, I've known farmers that don't have time to come to church because of the harvest. I got news for you. If you come to church, your harvest will get in on time. Give God the first place. Saul, where was he hiding? Amongst the equipment. He's speaking to men. See, some people are running from God. Oh, I would love to serve God, but I just don't have time. You know, I got a, I got a thousand acres to take care of. I got 20 motorcycles to take care of. I got the hot rod I got to take care of. I got, I got, I got, I got. Hiding amongst the equipment. Yes, come on. I got horses. I got cows. I got whatever. Saul was running from God. But you know the good thing is? God knew right where he was at. <laughs> They go, has he not come? God go, he's right here. Look at him. He's over here. I remember hearing um, Captain Crewman and Jim, uh, I forget what the guy's name was, but anyways, a man, he was running from God, and she was in the meeting, and she'd go, and there's somebody up there, and she goes, where is he at? And some little lady ran over to the, this preacher, he's a famous preacher today, and grabbed him by the arm and go, I got him, he's right here. <laughs> you know, God knew right where he's at, grabbed him by the arm, and he couldn't get away from it. <laughs> Have you ever been trying to run from God? That's the beginning of playing the fool. Because he knows where you're at. Okay, so Saul starts playing the fool. Number two, he does. This, in verse 8 of that same chapter, verse 10, I know I'm jumping back and forth, but I think you can follow it. You're smart enough. Verse 8, it says, Samuel tells him, he goes, you go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I'll come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of per, uh, peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait until I come, and you will show and show you what you shall do. Now, this is the prophet speaking to Saul, okay? Then if we jump over to chapter 13, in verse 8, it says, Then he, speaking of Saul, waited seven days according to the time by Samuel. See, there's a reference going back there. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, bring a burnt offering and a peace offering here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. And it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, guess what? Then Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and that he might greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me, that you did not come within the days appointed, that the Philistines gathered together. He goes on, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal, and I have not... So, made supplication to the Lord. Therefore I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to him, you have done foolishly. What is he talking about? Who had the right to offer off, uh, sacrifices? The priest. Saul was not a priest. He was a king. See, he got involved in areas he was not supposed to get involved in. You know, I know ministries. We, we've kind of referred to this in talking just on the phone the other day. We've known ministries that got involved with good things, but God didn't call them that. You know, people ask, why don't you pastor? I did pastor. I started a couple of churches in the, in the Ozarks here. One of them still going. One of our best support churches still to this day. They don't give me any credit for starting it, but I don't care. You know, I, was, I went to a meeting one time. We were having coffee after this lady sitting next to me. She goes, you actually started this church, didn't you? I go, shh, don't tell anybody. You know, because it doesn't matter. I mean, they're running 300 people, whatever, you know. People say, why don't you pass today? I'm not going to pass it. God hasn't told me to. I'm going to stay and do what God has called me to do. I know pastors that are trying to do my job. Right. Why don't you stay? No, you know, pastors need to visit the mission field to, so they got a heart for it. But they need to pastor the church. I know some pastors are never home pastoring the church. Yeah. Now, I'm not speaking about anybody, you know. See, get, don't get involved with what God hasn't called you to get involved with. I know people say, well, I think I'll pastor. That looks good. 
If God hasn't called you, don't do it. That's right. You're playing the fool. Somebody said, well, I'm going to get involved in a motorcycle ministry. If God hasn't called you, don't do it. That's right. I know I've been involved for years with it. You know? I don't, got, I don't want to play that game anymore with those boys. You know, I'm too old to play games with them. You know, I'm too old to wrestle with them. I can't run any. My knees are too bad. I just have to kill them, and, you know, that doesn't go good. <laughs> Never mind. Some of you are looking at me and think he's crazy. <laughs> you'll, you'll get that one later, you know. But he got involved with what God did not call him to do. And Saul said, or Samuel said, you have done foolishly this day. And then if you go on, read on a little bit more, and he said, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought from a man after his own heart. That's verse 14. See, Saul played the fool. Why? He tried to hide from the call of God. He got involved with things God had not called him to do. And then, number three, he makes excuses for it. Verse 11 there. Samuel said, why did you do this? Have you ever made an excuse for why you sin? You're playing a fool. Adam made the excuse. It's the woman. The woman made the excuse. It's the serpent. Today, we live in a society that makes excuses. It's everybody else's fault but my own. I grew up. My daddy, you know, he said, There's nobody, you're to, accountable for your actions. And one time I said, then what about my brother? My brother pastors a church today, and I said, what about my brother Bob? He said, you don't worry about Bob. You worry about Roger. You know. And I can remember, he said, whatever you do, you're responsible. I wasn't saved. I was in a bar. I wasn't saved. And a bar fight started. So I won't go into all the detail of it, okay? But there were some big boys involved in it. They came up to our local and they were, you know, wanting to cause some trouble. And we're in this bar brawl, and, and I had about a 200 and some pound guy on top of me, and I used to do some martial arts. And I'm underneath him, and I'm looking up, and I'm looking at his throat, thinking, I can just take that throat right out of him, and this will be over. You know what came back? My father's words, you're responsible for your actions. And I said, I'm not going to jail for this clown. Because at that time, the state police knew me, the FBI knew me, first, middle, last name, social security number. <laughs> okay? And I'm not joking. And I said, I am not going to prison for this clown. Next thing I know, I got hit over the head with a long leg beer bottle, and they don't break like they do in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> just, just so you know, give me some, that's Hollywood. What I'm saying that, you know, I could have made excuses. No, we, we all have problems. Amen? That's right. But instead of just saying, I sin, I missed it. So I go, well, the people had left me. There's another, there's a fourth one. He started worrying about his own name. Remember, he started, David killed his 10,000 and I killed 1,000. He got envious. See, Saul played the fool. Are you playing the fool? Are you running from God? Are you running from the call of God on your life? Maybe you're called to be a teacher. Maybe you're called to be a mother. You know, I, I, I'm no mother to left their children. I said, I can't understand that. You know. Maybe you're called to be a businessman. You know, God called, called you to be a businessman. Be a great businessman so you can support missions. Amen. Thank you. I got two amens here. You can support the church. I know all these businessmen get up. God made me a millionaire. What are you doing with it? That's right. Building another house. You know, isn't America great? I mean, I, I know it's coming up the highway here, man. All these big houses that never used to be there. They must be coming from Kansas City or somewhere. You know what I'm talking about? They're migrating out here. And I'm thinking, you know, when we have kids, we can't afford the big house. Now that the kids are grown up, we can afford it. By God, we're going to have it because we couldn't afford it then, but we're going to have it now. I don't need it. And that's, there's something wrong with this, you know, folks? Priority? Gone off the middle and again, I'll get off that. Think about it. We should be using what we have for the kingdom of God. How many bedrooms can you sleep in? How many bathrooms do you need in your house? I only need one. My wife might need a different one. I'm like, no, I won't go. <laughs> oh, she, she's definitely sitting there going. <laughs> Playing the fool. Saul plays the fool. Okay, don't play the fool. You got to call a God in life. We all got to call a God in life. It may be different, but do whatever God calls you to do and do it to the best of your ability. If you miss it, 
when you miss it, don't, don't make excuses for it. You know, grace is there. Pastor and I believe in grace. But grace is there not so that we can sin, but, but so that when we do sin, we can still walk with God and get back up. Amen? Amen. There's, a, there's a translation that was printed out by the Assembly of God called the Cotton Patch Translation. It's a New Testament done in the days of the 60s. John the Baptist coming and wear Levites on a leather coat. And the Gentiles were blacks and the, and the Jews were white. And they're quite interesting. And they're going from Georgia and stuff like that. So it's written in this environment. And you read it thinking, it's not like today. You know what I mean? And so you're reading it. And it goes into Romans. And it says, grace abounds. You know, where grace abounds, or where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Shall we sin so the grace may more abound? And the translation says, I quote, hell no. <laughs> I know it's being most emphatic. No. But grace does abound. Thank God. Amen? Amen. But don't play the fool. That's right. Okay. I got to move on here. Okay. Number three. What's number one? Number Thank you. What's number two? Number, number three. Don't die a fool. Oh, Somebody said, how are you going to die a fool? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> Turn with me to 2 Samuel. Are you getting anything out of this? 2 Samuel, I'm going to read verse, in chapter 3, verse 33 and 34. And then I, I'll kind of try to tell the story again. It, the Bible students, you go back and check it out. I had, a, I had a Bible theologian challenge me on this, and he wrote me a long email. I said, you're right, <laughs> when he got done, because he went and did a checking on what I was getting ready to say. He said, and the king sang a lamentation over Abner and said, should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, nor your feet put into feathers. As a man falls before wicked men, so you fell. This is King David crying and singing a song over Abner. Abner has died. Now, Abner didn't need to die, but David said, you died as a fool. Okay. How, why, how did he die as a fool? Well, go back up to the second chapter. David and Saul's men were in fighting against him. Judah and Israel, you know, were fighting and everything about it. And um, I got to make sure I get these right because Joab was David's right hand man, and Abner was Saul's right here hand man. Okay, and they're fighting and stuff. And finally, over in the second chapter. Uh, Azahel is chasing Abner. A A Azahel is uh, the brother of Joab. Okay? And he's chasing him. And, and it says that Azahel ran like a deer. He is quick. And, A and Abner looks behind him and thinks, sees who he is. And he says, listen, there's no reason to fight anymore. Let's, let's put the killing, let's stop the killing. Okay? So he's trying to make a peace treaty with him. And Azahel said, no, 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 no. And he keeps chasing him. And so Abner takes his spear and runs it this way, strikes him, and he dies. Okay? Now Joab's mad because he just killed his brother. But now Ad, Abner comes to David and, and, and pleads with David and says, I'll please, pledge my allegiance to you and stuff. You know, I, you know I've left Saul's company, so I'll plead. And David gives him permission, and he said, go to Hebron and live there. You do your study. Hebron was a city of refuge. A city of refuge. We have a city of refuge, folks. Amen. Jesus is our city of refuge. Now, Abner had the right to go there because he did not premeditate the murder. He, you know, it was done in self-defense. And so he was allowed to go there. And the way the rules were was that if you go to the city... As long as the priests were there, whoever would have your accuser could not come to the city and drag you out and prosecute you and kill you for murder. But as long as you stayed within the city. If you come outside that city, you were fair game, again, to those who wanted to persecute you. Okay? You, you follow the picture? And David gave Abner the right to go to the city of refuge because he didn't premeditate killing him. 
Okay, now, let's go back here to the second chapter. Verse 26. Joab, it says, had gone from David's presence, and he was mad because he found out what David had allowed Abner to do, and sent messengers after Abner, who brought him back from the well of the Syrah, but David did not know it. And, and now when Abner had returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him privately, and there stabbed him in the stomach so that he died for the blood of Azahel, his brother. Notice this. And we've done, I've done some research. The gates of the city were not just a door like that. They were archways. You know, and the, the leaders of the city, the elders of the city, would sit in that archway and, you, and judge the cases. Yes, you, you have a right to come in. So you had, maybe the archway might be as big as the platform, you know, where chariots would go through and everything. But you weren't technically in the city. You were in the gate. You had to get through that archway. Well, Ab, Joab could not kill Abner legally. So what does he do? He goes, psst, psst, come here, psst, psst, come here. I got a secret I want to tell you. Come on, step outside here. Come on, just for a little bit. Are you, are you getting the picture here? Yeah. The devil's going, psst, come here, come on, psst, psst, psst. I, I got to tell you something, psst, psst, psst. And Abner goes, what? Come? He comes out and he comes into the gate. Now he's no longer in the city's refuge. He's fair game. And he dies. That's why David said, Abner died as a fool. His feet weren't bound. His legs weren't bound. He was a free man, and he died as a fool because he came out of his city of refuge when he didn't need to. Folks, we are living in the end times. Thank God for grace. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. Thank God that we can cry and and get forgiveness. But are you going to risk it? What happens if you don't pray before the end comes? I got a city of refuge, and the Bible said the devil cannot touch me. When he looks at me, all he can see is the blood. I like an old illustration somebody says, when you speak the word of God, he doesn't know who's speaking. You know, you got the armor of God on it. As far as he knows, it's Jesus himself. Right. You know? Are you going to come out of that city and say, ah, come on, I'll just go out and play a little while with the devil? Because I can always go back and get grace. You might not make it back in the city. How many people, when they go and stand before God, he's going to say, you died as a fool. You didn't need to die. I give you a city of refuge. Jesus is our city of refuge, folks. Aren't you glad? See? Don't be a fool. Don't play the fool. And please don't die a fool. If you're in that city of refuge, they stay in it. Now, please, I'm not judging people because, you know, we, we have, we judge sin, big sins and little sins. We have socially acceptable sins and we have sins that are not socially acceptable, okay? You know, we need grace. Why? Have you ever said anything about another person, spoke any gossip? You need grace, right? The Bible says, let no corrupt word come out of your mouth. If you're saying it, telling a tale, that's a corrupt word. You need grace. And if you go and list the list, man, I tell you what, I don't know about you, but I need all the grace I can. I'll read that list in, in Revelation in different places of all them listed together, murderers, whoremongers, and all this stuff. And then they have gossipers and backbiters. And I'm thinking, dear God, you know, I mean, you know, every time. I need grace. Because I'll get trapped all the time. I, got, I had to repent one day. I know you don't have to. I mean, I, more than one day, but you know. <laughs> Somebody's talking about some ministry and what they were going to do and how they needed so much money, and I just went, I made a comment. And God just called me on the carpet, and I had to call, call this brother, brother that I made the comment to. I said, I have to call you and ask you to forgive me, man. I had no business making a comment about somebody else's ministry. He goes, that's all right. And I said, no, it's not all right. It's because this list is right there with the, with the murderers. Amen? See, any time we go out and talk about the pastor... You come outside the city. You're playing the fool. And if you play the fool long enough, you can die the fool. Now, is that the will of God? No. Not the will of God. God doesn't want any of us to die as a fool dies. See, 
We find in Psalm 46 that God is our refuge. Jesus said he is the door in, into heaven, into the kingdom of God. Hebrews tells us in chapter 6 that, you know, we have a high priest after order of Melchizedek. All we have to do is stay in the city, folks. We can't earn it. We just stay there. Abner didn't have to do anything. He could just sat there and went. <laughs> you know that? He could just sat inside, stay way inside the gate and go. Hey, Joab. I know that's not re being religious, but, you know. But Joab goes, psst, psst, psst. Come here, come here, psst, psst. I, want, I got a secret. Come here out here. I got to tell you the secret. You'll like this. Folks, time's too late, amen, to be playing games. Amen. Time's too late. We need to be real with God. He's real with us. I want to read one more scripture in closing. Is that all right? Yeah. I don't know. It doesn't really have anything to do with this, but I just want to read it. I like it. Psalms 56. And then I'm going to close with this. Don't worry, this is, there's two verses in this chapter, and then that's the last scriptures I'm going to read. You know, we, uh, preachers lie all the time. We said, I got one more scripture, and then we go, then we read three. Yeah. Liars go, you know, oh, oh, we won't go there. <laughs> yeah, plead in grace. Grace, Lord. But look what Psalm 56, verse 3 says, and then we're going to read verse 11. So you have a choice today. I can stay in my city. I don't have to play the fool. I don't have to die the fool. In Psalms 56, verse 3, David writes, When I'm afraid, I will trust in you. How many know that's good? But look what verse 11 says. In God I will, I will pray, oh, verse 11, In God I put my trust, I will not be afraid. Do you see anything different between those two scriptures? When I'm afraid, I will trust in him. In God, I put my trust and I will not be afraid. See, there are people that say, you know, when the storms come, will you run to the rock? What are you doing away from it? The Bible says you build your house on the rock. So when the storms come, you don't have to go anywhere. What you're going to do? I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to keep doing what I've been doing. I've been trusting God these years. I've been standing on the word of God. I don't have to change. Now, if you haven't, when fear comes, then you need to get in and trust God. But if you've been trusting God, you don't, fear's not going to come about you. Come Do you see a difference there? Yes. See, most people are crisis Christians. When the problems come, they run to church. Call the pastor. Just build your house. Stay in the city of refuge. When the storms come, folks, and they're coming, they'll come. Somebody said, what are you, you going to do when it all comes? I'm not going to do anything. I'm fine. I'm fine. Now, I don't, I'm not foolish, you know. Somebody goes, can I look in your truck? Yeah, you can look in my truck if you want. you find all kinds of stuff in there. Find, you'll find food in the back of it because I'm on the road, you know, if I break down. You know, I, I mean, I, I'm not foolish and stuff, but I don't live in fear. I travel all around the world. You know, the hardest part of traveling around the world when, when you leave America is you can't go armed. Kenya. And, you know, I've had people tell me, don't go to Kenya. Tear Fund has advised their people that they're not to travel alone in Kenya anymore. That's Tear Fund, a big organization. Your missionaries there, I don't see them traveling with a big entourage. What? We don't have fear. Somebody says, aren't you ever afraid? No. No. I'm too busy living. Amen. You know, when you're living, you don't have time to be afraid. Right. You know, you get on the, your motorcycle and something happens, you, and, you, and you have to stop quick, avoid something quick. You, you're not afraid, you just do it. Right. As later, fear will try to come on you, but you go, no, no, right then, I wasn't afraid. Why? I'm too busy staying alive. A soldier's not afraid in battle. Right. Yeah. Fear comes after the battle or before the battle. But during the battle, he's too busy living. Any soldiers, can you verify that? You've been to combat? Isn't that right? During the battle, you don't have time to be afraid. You're too busy living. If you're afraid, you're going to die. See, 
they in the city of refuge? Gave you three points today. What were they? Number one? Number two? Number three? Bow your heads. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Father, we know that if you have called us, you will complete it. Faithful you that has called us that will do it. Father, we know that we live in vessels, as Paul said, that we struggle with our flesh at times. But Father, we come to you and we say, Lord, let us come into that city of refuge and stay there. Teach us how not to go out and follow after the lies of the devil. Teach us, Lord, how not to play the fool when you've called us to something, when you've called us to be a, a parent, you've called us to be a teacher, a business person, a, a police officer, a soldier, whatever it is you call a minister, Lord, that we'd be faithful to the call that you put on our lives. And that we wouldn't try to do somebody else's job, that we'll do our job. And Father, we're not trying to look, make ourselves look important. Because, Lord, if we don't even preach one time, you'll still take care of us if we're doing what you called us to do. So, Father, I thank you today that your grace is sufficient. I thank you, Father. It does not give us a license, but it is sufficient to see us through. And so, Father, I pray for every person here. In Jesus' name. If you're here today and you come and you say, well, I don't know if I'm in that city of refuge. I don't know if I've ever ever made Jesus the Lord of my life, that I, I come to church, and you come to a good church, but I don't know if I've ever done that. Don't leave today without knowing that you know that you know that you're in that city of refuge. You don't know what's going to happen out here. We have friends that have been pastors that died in car accident, not because of them, but because of somebody else. We don't know the answers to it. I'm not prophesying that over anybody. We don't want any of that. But you know what? One thing I want to know is that I, no matter what happens, you know, I, I've lived a good life. If I go home today, I want to, I want to know that I'm going home to be with Jesus. Amen. Amen? I'm not planning to go in yet. I'm not done. I'm not satisfied. I'm just saying. But, you know, we have no guarantees. We have some promises, and we can believe God for them. But if you don't know Jesus, I want you to raise your hand and I'll pray with you. Anybody at all? I mean, we're at church, so you're not a fool. If you've been playing the fool, I want to pray with you. You say, I, I, I know I need to get more involved, but I don't have time. I'm too busy. You cannot be too busy for God. You know, God can help you do things the first time. You ever look for your car keys, and after 20 minutes you pray, and God shows you right where that, and you wait for 20 minutes? Or your motorcycle fob. <laughs> you know, if you just do it God's way, things go quicker. I hate doing things twice. I really do. I'm thinking, can't I just do it right the first time? Well, you know, if you're a farmer, put God first. That harvest will come in. If you're a businessman, put God first. That business will work. Whatever it is, amen? Anybody need prayer for that? I'm going to turn it back over to your pastor. I love this man. We don't get to spend enough time together. I know, like that. Love you, brother. Check, check. I love having people come that actually impart something to our church. Amen. I love it. I don't like to come someplace where somebody's just stirring up air. But Roger always blesses us when he comes. And uh, we want to be a blessing to him. You know this routine. We've done it many times. Uh, you know, uh, I remember years ago, I won't say his name, but there was a guy I wanted to come. He said, he said I don't come for less than $5,000. And I said, well, you don't come here at all. And uh, so, but what we do want to do is we want to take up an offering. This is a love offering. He was a blessing to you. He's a blessing to us as a church. He's imparted what God gave him for this church, and we're changed because of it. 
And so let's dig deep and let's be a blessing. He came on love offering. Let's show that love. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. The same way that we did when we uh, took up our, our tithes, just walk forward with your offering, put it in the plate. Make your checks. If you make, make it to heart of God, we'll write him one check. Amen. Don't be a fool. Don't play a fool. And don't die a fool. Amen. I love it. Are you sneaking? Hallelujah. 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 Father, I thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you for the blessing that Roger is to us. I thank you that he's been obedient to speak your word. We have made that choice, as we always do, to receive that word and make it our own. And Father, I just speak a blessing upon Roger's life a continued blessing, business, home, social, physical, mental, and spiritual. Pour out your love, your power, your grace, your spirit in such a mighty way that wherever he travels, people will say, surely he has been with Jesus. Amen and amen, amen. Hallelujah. Uh, do you have any materials or anything like that? Or? No, nothing to sell, huh? Got a business card. Come up and thank him for being with us today when we dismiss.